welcome to the show. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? Well, I'm Blair Peverty. I'm Vice President of Government and Corporate Relations here at a utility up in uh, the Toronto area. We, uh, we're an electricity utility that uh, delivers power to about a million customers between, well, from St. Catharines in the Niagara area all the way around Toronto, all the way up to Barrie. So it's about a 2,000 square kilometer service territory. And we run all of the uh, wires and poles and electricity distribution in there. Company's been in business. Uh, it's the result of a merger of four other utilities that took place uh, early in 2017. And so we're just about 18 or 19 months into our uh, business life and uh, things are going quite well. Awesome. And you, we met because you graciously wrote me after reading my book, which is always so much fun for me. Well, I thought it was a great book and i um, always looking for, um, you know, uh, modern thinking, up-to-date thinking on crisis management and crisis communications in particular, because uh, that's one of the areas that I'm responsible for here is, is the communications to the public and within the, uh, the company and also to our government stakeholders and other community stakeholders uh, during times of emergency. And the, the types of emergencies that are most common on electricity grids, of course, are, are mostly weather-related serious storms that bring down power lines and cause interruptions. So um, I found your book to be timely and uh, uh, up to date with, you know, modern thinking. And it was something that I was, I shared with my employees here. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm excited to be having this conversation with you because I think that viewers and listeners are going to learn so much. The, you work in a world of basically issue management. And then when it really hits, it's crisis management. Well, it is, and we, um, uh, because of the, uh, I think the uh, weather uh, events that seem to be happening more frequently these days and over the last decade, I suppose, um, utilities like Electra um, are, are uh, required to have very robust uh, emergency management processes. In fact, the province of Ontario has a, instituted an incident management system that, uh, uh, you know, the utilities follow that framework and uh, it involves uh, not, not just electricity companies, but uh, other first responders and municipalities and other levels of government to make sure that we're all on the same page and we all um, operate in the same frameworks during serious emergencies. So we follow that, uh, the um, inc incident management system closely and we, that requires, you know, a series of, of dry runs, table exercises throughout the year. We also have an emergency, manage, uh, uh, emergency uh, management system of our own inside and also a enterprise risk management system that, that, um, that uh, identifies the key risks facing the business. And of course, one of those risks that would logically you know, face an electricity utility is a serious storm. So we have uh, a number of um, formal emergency management processes in place here. And under those processes, of course, uh, communications plays a very important role and is flagged as one of the key uh, uh, areas that the utilities and the companies are expected to, to have robust plans in place for that, that we practice regularly. Awesome. So is the, the common language um, that's instilled by the government, is that ICS? Yes, it is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's IMS, I think. It's in Incident Management System. Okay. And, and it, um, it, it, it is a very, very good system. It requires uh, all areas of the companies or many areas of the company to, to uh, you know, understand it. And, and each area has its role. And, of course, the, um, the uh, communications uh, what has been identified as a key area of emergency management, as it should be. As it absolutely needs to be. Um, and what is, so what's Electra's role in crisis communication? And I'd love to separate that in two ways. So internally, because you need to have strong internal communications within your team to make sure that you're taking the right courses of action and everything is seamlessly flowing um, for managing issues as well as crises. But then you wouldn't necessarily expect, I don't think, perceptively, um, that an electricity company would be communicating externally other than to their direct customers, right? So can you talk a little bit about those two dynamics? Well, 
internally, uh, it's critical that, you know, at, at, at the moment an emergency hits, such as a serious uh, storm and widespread lengthy outages, that the corporate communications function is up and running and, and directly connected to the, to the uh, engineers and technicians in the company that are actually addressing the, the problem, which is damage to the grid. So, you know, within, within minutes or immediately, as soon as the emergency management system is invoked, um, all control of the utility is handed over to the, to the incident manager. And, and then my staff essentially report to him or her, uh, depending who happens to be in charge at that point, and they immediately, you know, um, uh, follow the, the protocols that are in place and, and they get their information in stages and it's, and it's flowed down, it's cascaded down in an or, orderly fashion. Two communications officers who are in place then to uh, put that information out either within the utility to our own employees or externally through the media or social media to customers, but also to major government uh, uh, agencies and officials and um, other stakeholders who may need information from us. Um, so these, these emergency management systems are very useful because it, it takes the, the thinking out of the initial uh, reaction and, and people go right into their, their roles immediately and then wait for information to come in from the field. Um, so, so, so it is a multi-pronged uh, communications uh, function that takes place here um, w because our own employees are often hit or, or likely would be uh, in, you know, impacted by widespread outages as well. So not only are their homes and out of power, but they need to get to work. And if there's widespread damage due to a tornado or high winds or you know, serious ice storm, you know, they themselves could have difficulty getting to where they need to be. So all of these things need to be taken into account. And, um, you know, I think what, what has changed in my uh, estimation over the past decade or so is, is the, uh, the adaptation of these formal um, frameworks and the recognition that communications is such a key role. It is. Um, can you talk to us? I love to make things real. And um, as real as you can and would like to, I, there's certain things that you've said that are, are so important. And I want, I would love it if listeners and viewers could really visualize what that looks like. So just beginning with that process of cascading, um, what high level, what does that framework, that protocol look like? Well, we've identified as part of the, uh, the incident management system, um, employees, or actually not employees, because employees change. Employees you know, can leave the company or be, move on to different roles. The positions within the communications area are identified as, uh, uh, as, as communication leads during emergency, and then other ones are in place as um, information coordinators and then spokespeople. So the communication lead position is identified and, and, and it's something that we look at every six months as part of the review of the system. But when an, when an, an event happens, uh, that communication lead is immediately, uh, I'll say, assigned to the uh, incident commander who's normally not a communicator, probably in a, in a utility uh, situation would be an electrical engineer. Yeah. Um, that, that staff person then is reporting to him or her and um, follows, uh, uh, gets, gets information through that incident commander. And then the communications uh, lead then flows that information to uh, the communications specialists that are uh, located in the office who then take that information and um, react to it. Um, so that if there's a problem, uh, you know, in a particular part of the service territory where, you know, maybe there's been an, an environmental spill as a, as a result of the storm, that information then would flow down to uh, a communications specialist and likely, or there may well be media inquiries about that spill or, you know, government inquiries about what happened out there, the uh, communication specialist is then in a, uh, required to pull together the, the information that she has, pull together the key messaging of it, and quickly flows that up, uh, back up the chain for approval, and at that point it's released. This takes place in, in a matter of minutes, which is, um, you know, 
why the dry runs and the table exercises are so important just to make sure that everybody is comfortable with these processes. Um, so if we, for example, uh, we had a serious ice storms last spring up here where, um, you know, we had several days worth of outages and, um, um, and it, the emergency management system was put in place or the, the, the uh, incident management system and um, communicators then were, were actually not reporting to me. They were reporting directly into the command center. And um, I was getting information like the rest of them, uh, a company, uh, through this process. Um, one of the things we, of course, that all uh, emergency uh, people out there know is that if it's, a, if it's a long event, if it's an event that's going on for you know, more than 12 hours or days for, uh, for that matter, then uh, fatigue starts to fit in, uh, set in as well. So it's, it's critical that uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, roster um, uh, times for them to start their shifts and get off it so that they're not over time and that we can provide 24-7 uh, uh, coverage for this. So um, all of this uh, becomes, I, I won't say um, happen by remote control because <clears throat> it doesn't, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it happens because of lots of practice and dry runs, but uh, it does remove it's, these systems are intended to remove any uh, or minimize confusion uh, in the early stages of an emergency, and they're quite effective in doing that. Absolutely. And one of the things that I see often with organizations that are just beginning to make progress within their crisis readiness is the team having that dedicated or those dedicated people who are that link between communications and operations. So your incident commander and your the liaison for that um, is so essential. And it's so essential to have that established and for everybody to understand that because one of the common errors that I see happen is people want to help and they want information. And if they don't, if they aren't familiar with the process and confident in the fact that they will not be overlooked or forgotten, they're going to reach out to somebody who is dedicated to something and too busy and then that creates a bottleneck and creates a risk within you know the incident command or the incident management well that's right and, and these systems are based on trust um, and the trust is built through uh, rehearsal yeah. and um, uh, everybody understanding their role and the roles being clear um, and um, I, we find that uh, in the dry runs one of the most uh, important aspects of them is the debriefing at the end where we where we go over um, what worked well and what didn't and what, and what problems might have happened. And uh, invariably there are tweaks made, adjustments made to the process. And it usually has to do with where a, uh, a the most recent one we had was where a government relations specialist whose role was to you know, communicate to uh, 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 government authorities um, wasn't getting his information directly from the communications lead. He was getting it from one of the other incident commanders from another operations area. And this was causing him some difficulty in that he, his messages weren't directly aligned with what was coming out of the communications office. So we made a, a change at the end uh, when we did the dry run, after the dry run and said, okay, from now on that uh, government relations staff will be getting their information directly from the communications staff. Uh, so that that messaging is aligned and that uh, he or she is getting it fast and accurate. And um, so that's the kind of thing that, you know, everybody, everybody feeds into. Um, it's the kind of problem that would be noticed not only by the GR specialist, but also by the operations manager. And uh, it, it's a kind of, of, of adjustment that, that should be made and is quite easily made and ends up being very effective. Absolutely. And easily made is is always um, something that just I see it often and it can be through stimulations you find those like those tweaks or those gaps that you can that you can mend right. um, or in your incidences you know real incidences and the importance of the debrief afterwards but the <clears throat> smallest of tweak can help mitigate the biggest of complication in the process Right, and, and um, you know, that's, that's a good case where we say it's easily made and it is easily made, but it's also formally made. So once we all, oh, absolutely. Agree, once we agree that, okay, you know, this person should be getting his information from another source, 
then that process is 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 actually made to the framework. One hundred percent. And all of the documents are changed so that, regardless of who is stepping into that role, I mean that particular government relations specialist may be on vacation, yeah. and one of his or her colleagues has to take it in. There is no confusion. No matter who comes into that role or, or picks up the uh, comes in on shift knows exactly what, uh, you know, where she should be getting her information. What, the other, the, yeah, the, the other thing too, is that we, we keep logs all the way through um, this, uh, an event. So um, each communications uh, specialist then uh, keeps a log of, you know, what calls are coming in, what decisions were made, um, who contacted her about what, uh, what were the key messages. And then that is all time-based. And then it's handed over to the next uh, communication specialist that comes in at the, at, at the beginning of her shift. So, it, and there's a, there's a, you know, about a 15 or a 20 minute crossover between them where they share information and the person coming off shift takes the time to fully brief the, the, the new employee who's coming on so that they're ideally a seamless shift. And, it, and that helps to build the confidence of the of the person just beginning her shift, if she's walking into the middle of a of a serious problem, um, it helps to you know bring her up to speed quickly, and get her up and running uh, as quickly as possible. Do you incorporate that into your simulations and your drills? Yes, yeah. yes, it is wonderful. And, and um, you know they 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 sit and we, we sit and uh, together and share uh, information, share the logs. And, and those written logs are so important. Well, I guess that you can do it by computer as well. But those logs are so important because that's what we go back and review uh, during the dry runs, uh, during the uh, debriefs. And it also helps you know, people understand and remember what, what worked, what didn't, maybe some idea they had during it. Um, so all of this is important. And, and it's all about rehearsal and, um, and you know, um, kind of going through the motions so that when a problem does hit, uh, you know, people are quickly able to get in, up and running. Um, ex share with listeners and viewers what those logs look like. What are some examples of things that you document so to make that real for them? Well, um, they, it's, it's, it's not too many things. One would be a major event that happens. So for example, if they're in the middle of a, an emergency and then another power line comes down somewhere causing, you know, exacerbating the problem, and that happens at 10.05, the, um, the communication specialist would log that and uh, also log that the information that she received from operations about that and, uh, and what she did with that information. And what she did with that information normally would be forwarded on to one of her colleagues to develop key messages and get background to it that they could release to the media and other people who might be impacted by that. And so that would be a, you know, probably three or four sentence uh, at, at a particular time. So 10.05 a.m., uh, that information came in and she would put a short paragraph as to what she did, what she, what she, under, what she learned, and what she did as a result. And then the next, um, uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes later, depending on what was going on, if there was another change, she would update that. Um, the key being then at, um, uh, in these emergency systems, there are period periodic um, roundtables or check-ins under the control of the incident commander where uh, people report in what's happened over the past couple of hours. And that, uh, those logs give the communications staff uh, a record of what they've done, what's happened, and um, uh, helps them to feed in productively to the, to the overall uh, conversation, which is basically a review of what has happened over the past couple of hours and what they expect to happen over the next few hours until the next call. Excellent. And um, so there's so many reasons why alternate within, it's, there's so many reasons why um, governance structure, rules and responsibilities need to be assigned by, not by person, by human, but by role, right? right. And then there's so many reasons why you need alternates to those roles. And you've named a few just in the sense of in a natural disaster or type of event, some people will be impacted and may not be able to get in and, and perform their their tasks or their roles and responsibilities. Um, people might be on vacation. The need to, for your, in particular your case, the 24 seven 
management of the incident, so having those time shifts. So that's three reasons why alternates are so important. For an organization like yours, where it's so critically important, how many alternates do you have per role and responsibility? Well, that's, that's a great question, and it's something that we're, we're actually looking at now. Um, uh, I think that if we ran into a uh, more than a three-day event, uh, the, the toll, the fatigue would set in um, on the staff that I've got. And, I, you know, there's probably about five or six uh, communications specialists that would be given formal roles under the system. Um, we had a discussion the other day about that not being sufficient in, in, a, in a more lengthy event. Uh, so I will be having discussions, I'll be looking for competencies, um, you know, that would fit logically into, into the communications office uh, during a, an emergency. And it's likely we would start to look at the marketing group um, uh, in an emergency, of course, you know, the company is, is all hands on deck. There wouldn't be a lot of marketing going on, and uh, many of those employees have strong communication skill uh, and would be uh, valuable assets to bring in just to triage media calls or to help organize other information that's coming in. Uh, so I think that we'll be expanding that uh, probably to another four or five positions that would be available or on call you know, if we got into a multi-day event. Um, the issue of fatigue is, is, is a real one. Um, and, um, you know, we've been in them, uh, not at this company, but at other places I've worked where it's been a 12 or a 13 day uh, outage or emergency. And after um, five or six days, um, it really does start to take a toll on people. And uh, we, so you can't, you need backups. And I think we need about another five or six here, I think. And that's something we'll be looking at um, over the next few months. And how long is each shift? We, um, uh, we started, that's a great question. We started them uh, as 12 hour shifts. Uh, we, our first multi-day event happened last April. There was an ice storm that hit Southern Ontario. And we started them on 12 hour shifts and uh, within a couple of days, um, it, was, it became evident they were too long. So we've cut them back to eight hours now, and it may well be six, I think. If we, you know, after a few days of eight hour shifts, 24 seven, we may wanna cut back to six. The problem is the, the, the hardship is on the employees who are doing overnight um, work because that is uh, out of their normal routine. And, you know, if they're working from, say, midnight to seven or eight in the morning uh, for a number of days in a row, uh, that can be difficult, especially if, you know, I mean, a lot of them have young families and, you know, there's disruptions going on there. So, so the more hands we can have on deck, the better. And I think a six to eight hour shifts uh, are, are reasonable. Awesome. I think so, too. And to kind of paint a picture, your drills that you do and then the debriefings that you do after a real incident, what is the duration that you usually dedicate, time duration that you usually dedicate to each of those? Well, the drills before uh, start at 8 in the morning and go until about 3.30 in the afternoon. And okay. they require several shifts as well. So we'll put uh, communicators on for three hours at a time. Uh, just so that they get used to the uh, the routine of going in, starting a shift, handing over to another person. And that's not just the communicators, that's right across the company. So that all of the operations, all of the people involved in the, in the emergency are doing, you know, say a three hour shift and then, and then a turnover to another person. So it gets everybody used to that process. Um, and, and then at... Um, if, if we wrap it up at 3.30 in the afternoon, we take an hour to go around the table uh, and, and people are located across the company. So not, ev not everybody's in the same office. So a lot of people are on the phone calling in. Uh, we go around and, and basically give a recap uh, as to what worked and what didn't in our estimation. And these are fairly brief uh, and they're based on the notes we've been taking uh, through, the, uh, through the day. And then about uh, uh, 10 days later, there's a, a meeting, uh, uh, usually about a couple hours long, where the, um, the people in charge of emergency management here have taken all of the input, distilled it down into a report, 
of what worked, what didn't, uh, best next steps. And uh, then we have a management meeting there and go over it formally. And then, uh, then, then usually as a result of that, each of us has uh, tasks to do, things to update, things to change. And uh, we're expected to do that and then feed it back into the emergency management um, director. And then she, uh, again, distills that and schedules another meeting. So we're meeting probably quarterly uh, around these things with full, uh, you know, tabletops at least once a year that are quite involved. And, okay. and interestingly, the, the communications uh, staff feed into the scenarios that are planned for these tabletops. And so they feed in real uh, communications problems or issues that might occur given a particular scenario that they're presented with. So what is, and, but that's not shared with the communications staff uh, before the event. Uh, so the director of communications here would feed in what he would like to see the communications officers presented with during this emergency. Uh, and then um, uh, they're, they're actually caught by surprise, but, uh, have, but there's nothing in there that would be surprising given the, the, the nature of the event, uh, but it makes it more real. Yes, agreed. And it's really important to have focused objectives when you do these drills. It's not a catch all, um, it shouldn't be. You need to have focus objectives, which is the best way to progress the strong, the, in, with the most strength. Yeah, and, and the objectives, uh, the, the drills um, are based on, uh, the ones we've had lately are based on very, very credible, likely scenarios. Um, yes. A tornado, you know, a serious ice storm, catastrophic damage to the grid in some way um, that, um, you know, uh, are, are likely and uh, unfortunately common given the weather patterns we're seeing today. Um, but, but it does, everyone's different and, and we have a very, very, you know, quite a large service territory here. So, you know, we could have a serious problem in part of our territory and, and nothing at all in another part. So that again enables us, it, if faced with that scenario, part of the response then would be moving emergency crews from areas that aren't impacted down to areas that are and all of the logistics that go with that. Um, also, if we had to bring in emergency crews from other utilities, then we look at, well, what's the process for doing that? Where are they going to sleep? Uh, how are we going to feed them? Uh, how are we going to equip them? All of those scenarios are worked through, um, through these tabletop um, exercises. Excellent. And you do something um, that you shared with me once that I really thought was exceptional, and that was that you bring in... Um, commentary and feedback from stakeholders from the, your communities in uh, that you get I think uh, through social media if memory serves and you bring that to your team in real time who aren't on social media experiencing those praises well one of the um, one of the uh, uh, benefits of social media and there are many uh, but uh, if the utilities uh, you know when we get into these serious outages is usually inclement weather and it could be cold. And so people are out of, out of power and they're cold and, and, it, and it's very uncomfortable, sometimes dangerous. So when they see, and the crews are out there working in tough conditions. Um, so when a crew goes into a neighborhood and starts to bring power back, oftentimes or many times, there's very positive, obviously, response from the people living there and they're happy they're getting their lights back and their heat back. Um, and they see the crews out on the street working and in the neighborhoods working. Oftentimes they do tweet or post on fa our Facebook channels, um, you know, thanks and, 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 you know, encouraging messages to the crews, which we um, actually print off and post in their marshalling areas because they're coming in at, uh, you know, um, you know, six in the morning or, you know, 12 at night and, and, and gathering up their stuff, getting ready to go to their trucks. They're not looking at uh, social media on their phones necessarily. So we do post those around the office and they are well received. Um, I think it's, it's also important to, to note that the role of, of social media today in, in emergencies is, is, is really a new phenomenon. I mean, it, it, it's within the last seven or eight years, uh, it really has become the, one of the main channels for utilities like ours to get the word out to people. 
Um, and um, so our social media, our Twitter feeds and Facebook in particular, Twitter mostly uh, become major uh, information channels for us and news media outlets actually follow the Twitter feeds. So it changes the whole relationship around news releases and, and what have you. And oftentimes, most of the time these days, we're getting contacted by news outlets, you know, traditional news outlets based on information that's going out over social media. And then they'll follow up and of course, and they'll wanna do you know, on-camera interviews or you know, radio interviews over the phone our newspaper reporters will want to do, do an interview as well. But a lot of it is driven these days by social media feeds. And of course, social media feeds aren't just picked up by news reporters. They're picked up by everybody. Yep, absolutely. And it's, you mentioned that it's important specifically for utilities and, and you know, organizations of that nature, but it, it goes across every industry. Um, social media is a means of communication. One that if it makes sense for your stakeholders is essential to, to leverage and offers us some very powerful and very um, new unprecedented opportunities to connect and to communicate and um, to get ahead. You know, it's interesting because the social is, is such a key part of our uh, important channel for us. Um, I mentioned the government relations uh, folks earlier and their uh, main uh, line of communication to their stakeholders, which would be, you know, uh, elected officials and city um, executives uh, is through email or telephone. So, you know, uh, depending on the stakeholder, yes. the communications channel uh, is, um, you know, you choose the one that you need. Um, those, those stakeholders in the political and the municipalities in the province who are dealing with this emergency on multiple levels, um, like, uh, I'll call it face-to-face -face communications, but it's certainly, it may not be face-to-face, -face, but it's certainly telephone, um, much more one-on-one uh, -on -one communication than social channels. Um, and we do let them know if we're issuing news releases, we make sure that they're on the, on the, on the list and uh, keeping them advised of what we're saying to their constituents and to the general public so that uh, they're up to speed on where we're at. That goes to, that's so important to note, that goes to really taking the time to do stakeholder mapping before an incident occurs and understanding what those expectations are, what the best strategy for communication is, um, what the demands will be, how to get ahead of that, putting, make sure, making sure teams are in a position to get ahead of that. Um, and one of the things that I've seen, I've seen, it's funny because I see organizations that don't use social media or, you know, digital, let's say, to communi communicate in crisis. And then I've seen other organizations that believe that they have the misunderstanding that um, it's, it's all about social media. So, for example, in an active shooter event, you're not going to be on Twitter, not mm -hmm. as your primary means of communication. Um, and yet I've seen that happen. So it, there's this, it can go to both ends of the spectrum. It really comes down to understanding who you need to communicate with and what that means and what's the best strategy of means and both um, tactics for that communication. Well, that's right. And, and social happens to work for something like a widespread power outage where you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people impacted instantly. Yeah. Um, but if you get a different type of problem, such as a cybersecurity attack or, you know, some other thing that might be disruptive to your company uh, in different ways, yeah. then social likely or may may well not be the right channel or That's not where be a get, primary yeah right and and you're going to want to get into more um hot media such as one-on-one -on -one or one on a few um you know we've been in events too where town halls have been necessary yeah. uh you know so, some issues aren't you know uh, particularly you know catastrophic damage things there might be a there might be you might we might be having a you know, a reputational problem over a project in a neighborhood where a different type of channel, a different type of approach is required, uh, all proactive, ideally, and all with the intent of managing the reputation of the company, as well as meeting the needs of those stakeholders. And uh, stakeholders many times are, are very local and um, have very, very um, local interests that uh, are not necessarily you know, conducive to widespread social communications. So important to note. Yep. 
I'm being very conscious, or I want to be very conscious of your time. If you can leave um, viewers and listeners with one piece of wisdom, one biggest lesson learned, whatever you'd like to share that you believe is really important for them to, to know through your experience. Well, I think it, it, it comes back to, you know, what you're writing about and what, and what so many of the um, uh, uh, programs in the schools now are teaching is this, this readiness and, and companies are going through these, these exercises and building these frameworks. And, and it has to do with readiness um, and um, uh, clearly defined roles of your communication staff as well as the operations staff that are going to be addressing the problem. Yep. Um, and looking at different scenarios that could happen. I mean, the most likely common things in, in my business happens to be, you know, widespread damage to the grid. But there are many, many other scenarios that we look at as part of our enterprise risk management process here. Um, that could be financial problems. It could be, you know, cybersecurity issues. Uh, it could be um, any number of things. Um, so so th there's a real value in, in kind of... Um, taking a look at, at realistically what are the things that could disrupt your business and um, what would be the, um, the, uh, the management or the mitigation that, that, that you would put in place should it happen. And by doing the, the thinking up front, um, it, it enables you to quickly get into a management um, uh, process rather than a reactive process. There will always be reaction to an emergency because you know, they're not predictable, they are, they are chaotic uh, by nature, and so there's going to be you know, always elements of uncertainty and surprise, but to have a framework or a plan in place that you can go to um, works wonders in terms of getting, getting the company up and running quickly and being able to address it confidently. Uh, and putting out uh, messages and, and managing the, the event in ways that are helpful to its stakeholders, including its employees and, and its customers. And um, it provides you with uh, confidence to be transparent because you know, you've got a system in place where you're getting accurate information that can be assessed and um, uh, put together for release uh, through, through what seem to be you know, rigid structures and channels, but in fact, which are critical to being able to, to react to any kind of chaotic event that might happen. That's so important. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for your time and sharing your experience. Where can people find and follow you and Electra if they want more information? Well, I'm at Electra, so it's uh, blair.peberty at electra.com. Um, and we're up uh, uh, in the area in southern Ontario, the geographic area basically surrounding Toronto. And um, I'm happy to chat with anybody who wants to follow up. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that generous offer. And thank you for sharing your brilliance and your experience with us. <laughs> this has been um, just fascinating. And I know that people are going to gain so much from it. So I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Melissa. I've enjoyed it too.